Okay, Chris, we're live. Thank you, and welcome everyone to the Institute of Politics and Global Affairs at Cornell University and our conversation with Huma Abedin about her direct and unsparing New York Times bestselling book, Both and a Life in Many Worlds. I'm Chris Reback. I am co-host of IOPGA's book series, Tonight with Dr. Basil Smeichel, and much to my own regret, if not yours, I am not IOPGA Director Congressman Steve Israel. Steve couldn't join tonight's event, but you know Steve. He promises to call each one of you who joined tonight personally to say thank you. Huma and Basil, he also sends great regards to you both. He asked me to make sure to spend a moment talking about IOPGA. I do everything Steve asked me to do, so let's talk about IOPGA for a moment. Its mission is to deepen discourse and raise understanding. Some brief uh, housekeeping. On May 24th, the, uh, the uh, IOPG will be hosting the Future of Democracy Summit at the Cornell Club in New York City. This will be a hybrid event. The summit includes sessions on radicalization and media manipulation, misinformation, disinformation, and fake news, and a bipartisan congressional salon on information elections and options for legislation moderated by Congressman Steve Israel. As always, to register for programs, go to the website iopga.cornell.edu and please follow the group on Twitter at IOPGA Cornell. That is one word. About our speaker tonight and my guest host, Huma Abedin, thank you for joining has spent her entire career in public service and national politics, beginning as an intern in First Lady Hillary Clinton's office in 1996. After four years in the White House, she served in the US Senate as senior advisor to Senator Clinton and was traveling chief of staff for Clinton's 2008 presidential campaign. In 2009, she was appointed deputy chief of staff at the US Department of State, whom has served as vice chair of Hillary for America in 2016, resulting in the first woman elected nominee of a major political party. She currently serves as Hillary Clinton's chief of staff, born in the US and raised in Saudi Arabia, whom moved back to the US in 1993. She lives in New York City with her son, Jordan, both and is her first book because why wouldn't you make your first book a New York Times bestseller, right, Homa? Uh, we are doubly honored tonight, talk about both and, because my co-host is Dr. Basil Smeichel. Basil is a distinguished lecturer and director of the public policy program in the Roosevelt House Institute for Public Policy at Hunter College. You can see it there over his left shoulder at some point if they are showing Basil. I don't know if we're showing you right now, Basil. He also lectures at Columbia University School of International Public Affairs and Teachers College. Basil regularly shares insights on electoral politics, governance, and public policy on national media outlets such as MSNBC, CNB, CNN, and Bloomberg TV. He also holds a PhD in politics and education and an MPA from some other Ivy League school that begins with a C and is in New York City. I guess it's called Columbia University, but more importantly, he received his Bachelor's of Science from the great Cornell University. Among Basil's previous honors and roles, he was appointed by former Governor David Patterson to serve as the Executive Director of the New York State Democratic Party, where he was the second, rankest, second highest ranking Democrat in the state. Basil also was a senior aide to Hillary Rodham Clinton on her Senate staff. Uh, what a Small World uh, with Homa Hare, where he advised Senator Clinton on statewide policy and politics. Basil, thank you for joining me on this. Uh, I know we're both looking forward to the conversation. Um, if you have some opening words, um, please let us hear them. Otherwise, uh, our campaigns met before the debate tonight, and they agreed that you would have the first question. So uh, I hand it over to you. <laughs> it's a, it is it is a smooth transition of power. Thank you so much, Chris. <laughs> Uma, it is wonderful to see you. I, I have to say, um, I read your book twice. Uh, I read it twice, both as a book of history, um, because you have walked through 
our history in some extraordinary ways with some extraordinary people. Um, I also read the book as someone who's, who met you in 1999 and has worked with you. And the two things that stood out to me, um, both from the text, but also from just uh, knowing you over these years, um, first and foremost is that you had this way of bringing out the best in people, the best in people that you work around. And, um, and it was always a joy to see you on the campaign trail and to know that Huma was part of this trip because I was like, okay, we're, we're, we're good. We're going to be good. Uh, and it was just, a, and I have to say that because it was just an incredible time in my life and I'm sure in yours as well to be uh, working on behalf of Hillary Clinton to make her a senator from the state of New York. Um, but I was also struck by your sense of purpose in life, in the roles that you have been in. And that actually brings me to my first question because I, it's amazing to read these early pages of the text as you go through the, your family, your history here in the US and abroad, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. Um, and I, I, I read, uh, your time about your time in college and reading Du Bois and Lorraine Hansberry and such. Mm. And in some ways, I, I started to ask myself this question about identity. Um, that as you're learning about yourself, as you're learning about the US, as you're learning about figures like Du Bois and Hansberry and the mobilization of peoples of color in this country, that you had been called all of this horrible stuff by conservatives. For a, for a period of time. And if you bookend that with John McCain defending you, was it on the floor of the, of, of, of the Senate? Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to visit this, this notion of identity and how you see identity, your identity, playing a role in the work that you do and in public service. Well, first of all, um, I want to start by saying when I when I went uh, when I drove to Oyster Bay to Theodore's Books to do a book signing in the fall uh, to this charming you know when I first wrote my book one of the the things I was most excited about was to do old fashioned book signings and then um, this little thing called COVID came and took over our entire um, life and world and I, I was one of the reasons I as I mentioned I was late is because. Um, my Hillary just tested positive. She's doing okay. She's got mild symptoms, but long story short, I walked in to this bookstore and Steve Israel, um, mentioned that, um, he was now, uh, at Cornell university and that it would be great to do an event at the Institute of Politics. So the fact that we're doing this, uh, I'm glad I'm thrilled to be, um, with all of you, but in particular, um, so I want to thank everyone in the Institute of Politics and at Cornell for having me. Chris, I will tell Steve that you um, have, you know, filled his shoes very, very well. Uh, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. And I confess I'm a little bit emotional to be on a Zoom with Dr. Basil Smichel because, um, as he indicated, we did meet in 1999 at a time when I believe we were children together. The difference was I spent 25 years of my life in politics and public service service, mostly hiding behind the principles. And that was Hillary. And, um, and it was Basil too. I mean, I think one of the reasons why I believe that we had an extraordinary time working together is that um, there's something about this culture called Hillary Land. And there's a whole chapter in the book called Hillary Land about people who come together to work um, uh, on, on behalf of causes that unite us, but also um, it becomes a family. It's a club. And once you join, it's a lifetime membership. And so I'm thrilled that we are in conversation together, a little bit intimidated because Basil was always smarter, wiser than the rest of us. And so thank you for participating. Um, uh, and, you know, that was such a, that question means so much to me. And no one's asked me that about my real kind of coming of age, um, because I am an American who lived, uh, it's funny, I did an interview earlier today and and the woman asked me this question, are you the first American really sort of advisor to a president and a secretary of state who spent her entire formative years out of this country? And it was, I was born in Michigan, moved to Saudi Arabia when I was two, and then I moved back when I was 17. And I was, I, I was a patriot, I am a patriot, I love my country, but I also saw, recognized from afar, um, 
Yes, that our, our history uh, is fraught, was fraught, is fraught. And did I think I would ever become a subject of that uh, kind of vitriol? No. And uh, as I write in the book, um, when I first walked into the White House in 1996, I was the anomaly. I was this, who's this interesting, different person who practices a faith that we're very unfamiliar with. And in the Clinton White House, there was a lot of bezel on the Clinton campaign. There was a lot of curiosity when Hillary was running for the Senate. You know, what is it about your faith? And I recognize it was the privilege, sadly, that I have to say this, is that I, it, we were in a pre-9-11 world. And so much changed about um, how we perceived uh, my religion and people from my part of the world um, unfairly, uh, but it became the reality. Um, so fast forward to 2012 when I'm working at the State Department and I have conservatives saying, we question your patriotism, we question whether you're loyal to this country because of your faith and your background and growing up in the Middle East uh, was shocking at the time. But I argue in the book that it was actually a little bit of an appetizer for what then you know, came to be. I mean, this, this notion, I mean, I think Islamophobia is a, real, is, a, is a real issue in this country now. I think there are people who are very scared of people from, with, with my background uh, or suspicious. And it's, again, it's one of the reasons I wrote the book is to share what it is to be an American Muslim. And John McCain defending me on the Senate was one of the most amazing. I mean, it really, Basil, you touched on a time, I believe, when our parties were just very different, that, you know, when you could be a, on a different political party from somebody else, sit at a table, respect each other, and defend each other. And John McCain uh, did defend me in that, That's right. in that time. Absolutely. Yeah, man, John McCain comes out as quite a hero a couple of times, a couple of few times in, in the book. Um, so, you know, as you would have expected, Basil already won. I read your book only once. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I read it really, really quickly, but um, given your characterization of him, if I'm only the second smartest guy talking with you tonight, <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. So, but in, in reading your book um, and even knowing the title and subtitle, hmm. knowing you as most of us, quote, believe we know you, we've read about you, we've heard about you, not knowing you the way Basil knows you, people who have known you forever. I was still struck by the incredible extent to which your life has been marked by a series of tensions, macro and micro. Your parents are from India and Pakistan. You split formative years, as you said, here and in the Middle East. You deeply believe in faith, and lived for years that were defined by unfaithfulness. You seem uh, to an outsider extremely private, yet lived the reality of having virtually every private aspect of your life made public. While many of us balance life as a professional and a parent, few help run a presidential campaign while dealing with child services, searching our homes. Amazing stories that you wrote about. You're raising a child of Muslim and Jewish heritage. On a micro level, you tell the story, even when experiencing incredible highs, the pride of hearing your mother introduce Hillary Rodham Clinton and review so many accomplishments at King uh, Abdulaziz University in the Dar al Hekma building. Am I pronouncing that close yes, to correctly? Very well. So, in that complex, that incredible, what must have been, it came across, it was so evident an incredible moment in your life, you're simultaneously managing the pain of uncertainty about, a pending, about your pending marriage. Um, obviously, you grew up knowing and recognizing your parents' background, the places you lived, but for that thing to have continued throughout um, is remarkable. So it, it made me think about, did you realize the various tensions as you were going through them? When and how did your life narrative become realized to you? And how do you balance that age old character conflict? Did you make your times, Huma, or did the times make you? <laughs> well, I wish I talked to you before I started writing the book because <laughs> this notion of micro and macro tension, I, I think I, I probably wrote about it um, subconsciously in part because um, you know, one of the things uh, for 
once people, and I hope everyone who's watching does have an opportunity to read the book, I'd be thrilled and honored. But I do write about one of the greatest tensions in our house was the fact that my father was essentially terminally ill. I mean, I share that I was born in Michigan. And when I was two, my father was diagnosed with uh, renal failure and told he had five to 10 years and to get his affairs in order, gets on a plane, we moved to Saudi Arabia, and I spent my formative years there. And I um, like perhaps many of, of the people watching, I had a mother who was sort of a superhero, superheroine. I mean, she went to work every day, she cooked meals, but she was also up in the middle of the night when my father was throwing up on the floor in the middle of his dialysis sessions. I mean, we did have this, you know, this big secret in our house that my father was very, very ill. And my parents had made a choice not to tell us. They wanted you know, their children, I was two, my sister was four, and my brother was uh, seven. And so they wanted us to have these carefree childhoods, which we have. And I find it really interesting that I now raise my son, Jordan, who you mentioned, who's 10. And one of the operating principles in our house is that there are no secrets in this house. We are, we, um, it, it, I have actually chosen to be the opposite of where my parents were. So there was tension in our house that we were unaware of. Um, on a very personal, deep level. On the India-Pakistan front, and you're right, you know, the reason my parents got asylum in this country is because my father was Indian, my mother was Pakistani, they could not have gotten married and lived in either country. But they were very explicit with us that you had to understand the differences, you know, which were, you know, frankly, political more than anything else, but that you were to love and respect both countries equally. So I think that training that my parents gave us of traveling the world, which we did every summer, we went to different countries and different cultures and different, you know, we were forced into conversations with the other, um, I think prepared me perfectly for being in both diplomacy and in politics, because you're constantly in situations that are uncomfortable and that, and that you know, these are conversations often people don't want to have. I mean, Basil and I had very similar jobs in some ways, is that when you have a principal who can go in and say, oh, you know, uh, this is, just, I'm having a lovely afternoon, and then she leaves, and then Basil and I have to deliver the bad news. That tension that my father taking us when we were raised, you know, as a as you know, practicing Muslims. I mean, we were living in monasteries in Greece. I have a memory of a summer, like my, my father said, you know, he used to have colleagues who would say to him, don't have, don't go into these conversations with other, with the other, like where angels fear to tread. And my mm. father was like, no, we have to approach, you know, the other side with respect and curiosity. And so I think professionally, it really, it helped me tremendously. Um, but I do think that uh, finding you know, obviously in my marriage, as you refer to, I mean, for people who aren't familiar, who haven't read the book, I had to go through something very publicly with my ex um, in which I was betrayed, not once or twice, but three times. And, and there's so much shame and humiliation that comes with that, at least, you know, in our case, there was. And so the word tension, like tension was palpable in my life for, you know, so much of my marriage. I, you know, write about my honeymoon year of waking up and, Buckingham Palace and carrying a secret pregnancy. And then, you know, my whole house of cards falling a few days later um, when, uh, when the story first broke about Anthony. So I have had to navigate tension on a micro and macro level, I would say maybe for my entire life. And maybe it's some of it's been conscious and some of it's been subconscious, but maybe it's also helped me be resilient. Um, and if I write my next book, I'm going to explore this whole, I'm going to explore this whole, you know, frame that you just presented to me because I find it very intriguing. Yeah, well, you you outline it, and it, it's it's evident throughout the book. And um, yes, resiliency, um, but energy. I mean, mm -hmm. relentless energy. I, I, I mean, we'll talk about some of that in a little bit. Um, I, I know that uh, Basil's got a, a follow up for you, but Yes, resiliency, but uh, the, the, the relentless energy comes across in the book as well. I guess Basil well, well, must know that about you already. Well, from Basil, <laughs> Basil does know that about me. And I think part of it, you know, the energy comes from the fact that every day, you know, I was asked this in, uh, the other day and somebody said, well, how could you get up and be so positive? And it's such a depressing time. And gosh, do I get up every hour to check the, the news, see what's happening in Ukraine? And I do. Um, but I, 
to be raised by somebody who woke up every single day not knowing how much time they had. And it's one of the first lines I wrote when I sat down on this laptop. I wrote the book on this laptop that I'm on the Zoom with you. One of the first lines I wrote in the book was my father was told he was dying. So he went out and he lived. And that was the attitude in which I was raised. It's like every single day that you are healthy and recognize that you have more privilege than millions of other people. I just, I have so much gratitude for that and energy, responsibility. Sorry, Basil. No, no, no. I just, I actually want to follow up on that point about sort of taking that point a little bit and talk about navigating certain spaces. Because one of the things that struck me in the book was this moment where you said that you should have advocated for yourself Mm -hmm. on the campaign, to be on the campaign. Yeah. And I, I want to talk a little bit about that because personal advocacy is something that I talk to my students a lot about. You know, I always say, don't walk into a room like a question mark. Um, and to be honest, that's something that I had to learn myself, actually, even on the campaign. Um, and, <clears throat> Find that hard to believe, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, is it? Because, you know what, but what's interesting is that there were so many instances, and now you have you know, make me go back and get a little teary eyed at this because there were so many instances where you personally and Hillary herself would say when others would just stand outside the room, both of you would say, come, no, come on inside, sit here, sit next to her. Right. And there's a, there, that provided agency for me. And what, what struck me about your comment is that in, in, in the book was that there are moments that, as strong as we may be perceived to be, there are moments where we may not be the best advocates for ourselves. And I just wanted you talk, wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about that. Uh, what would you say to your younger self? What would you say to students out there? And is this personal advocacy something that's gendered or perhaps even racialized that maybe for us, and sometimes I, I say it as well, like, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes Black folks uh, may be perceived as begging when other communities see it as leveraging your resources. Mm-hmm. And so, so I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that. You know, I, uh, I write about it throughout the book as I, I like many women and maybe this element is gendered. Um, I like many women, I think spend most of my adult uh, professional years with that famous word, the imposter syndrome. I did not mm-hmm. think I was good enough. I did, you know, even at the White House, I wasn't, I was never the best. I was never the smartest. I was never the prettiest. Never the anything is. What I did know is I was prepared to outwork everybody else. I mean, I, I was I was committed to doing the work, and that comes with being in an environment, a professional environment, where you feel valued. And the point that you make about Hillary, and not to, I mean, obviously we both worked for her, we were both biased, but objectively, you know, this idea of sitting at a table, and you know, I think a lot of leaders, both men and women. Often you don't want people around the table who are smarter than you because it just shows your, you know, what, what your inadequacies. And she was the opposite. She wanted everybody at the table smarter than her because that's how you got stuff done. That's how you were successful. And she did not have that insecurity. And she always believed there were more seats at the table for more people. And I felt that throughout my professional life, even though I never advocated for myself. It wasn't until I closed the book, submitted it to my publisher, and I thought, you know what? I never once asked for a job. It was always, I was offered this, I was always in service of, and now I happen to have a job that I loved and I happen to have a boss who was very supportive. And you're right, she saw things in me that even I was too scared to see in myself. So in the 2016 campaign, I write a little bit about this in the book. So I have a terrible fear of public speaking. I mean, just crippling fear of being in space. And um, I think you or Chris asked me this early on, I didn't answer it, you know, what, what, what is the one piece of advice you give young people, or maybe Basil, you give your students, but I always now say, once I have done this process of doing the thing that scares me the most, I always say, do, consider doing the thing that scares you the most, because it might actually be worth it. And in 2016, I remember there was this one story in the book I tell about, uh, I mean, there are all kinds of crazy stories I tell in the book, you know, like when I lose her clothes in the East River because of the helicopter, my first trip to New York, or when she's on stage giving her speech and she calls me over and says, I don't have my speech. And I run to the car. And, and I guess these are the moments when you figure out what you're made of, right? Like, can you actually rise to the occasion and fix the problem? Or do you just, you know, completely melt? But 
the story that I tell in the book that even stays with me now and I try to share with young people is when I was sitting, I was sitting in the car next to Hillary, we're on our way to an event and she's losing her voice. And she says, you know, I might not be able to do this next speech. I might not have time to go to both. You may have to do one of these for me. And I have, I still physically remember shaking and sweating and saying, but I can't do that. I'm not good enough. I can't give your speech. And so I, even though I had so much self-doubt, she didn't doubt for a second that I could do it. And I think having that kind of person in your life to say, you know what, you can do this. And not only can you do this, you can do it really well. I mean, I, I wrote this book. I wasn't even sure when I first started the book, I don't talk about this very often, but it was assumed I would need a ghostwriter. And in the end, I wrote it myself. And I shared the story that when I was 10, my father who brought back from his travels, he always brought books back from his trips and he brought back Silas Marner by George Eliot. And I, you know, I was 10, I didn't understand the material, but I read the introduction. I go to my father and say, I don't understand. Why did Marianne Evans have to write as George Eliot? And my father said in the Victorian era, women weren't taken seriously as a writer, but don't, as writers, but don't worry when you grow up and you write your own book, you will use your own name and everyone will take it seriously. And I think for all of us, whether it's women or it's any minority, it's people of color, it's it, the more, it is so much more important for us to, you know, force our way to the table, like, and say, I have a voice and a space and place here. It doesn't mean it's always necessarily welcomed, but that's why it's more important for us to not go away. Indeed, indeed. Or stay silent. In case we don't get to mention him or get a question in about him, reading your book, the way that you write about your parents, the impact um, of both of them on you. I mentioned your mother a moment ago, your father as well. And it is not possible to read uh, about his last time in the hospital, um, the going there, the expectation, him coming out of the surgery, but not making it after. It's not possible to read that and not feel um, what he meant. And I am certain still means to you, even as you sit there today, uh, just in case we don't get to him. Thank you, uh, thank you for saying that. Among the other uh, incredibly important influential people in your life is uh, that woman, I think her initials are HRC, that uh, <laughs> you both uh, know and have mentioned. Um, so for the rest of us who have not worked for Hillary Clinton, we have all heard and wondered about that gap, mm -hmm. the gap in the way that people like you who know uh, her talk about the distance between her public and private images. You touch on many of the issues that we've heard. Um, I had the great privilege a couple of times of hosting uh, Jennifer Palmieri, a uh, friend of yours, <laughs> both of yours, I'm sure. Um, yes. she, she talks about the frustration with that phrase. You mentioned it as well in the book, that, that phrase, I don't know, She's just not likable. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, we all know a great deal, and, and both of you, both you and Jennifer and others have written about what that means and tried to really dig in. Really, well, what do you mean when you say she's not likable? From, from, I was curious, though, from your perspective of living a life of both and of not always being perceived on the outside as you are feeling on the inside, Huma, What's your analysis of that gap for Hillary Rodden Clinton? The number of people, and it, I, 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 to be honest, I know it drives her crazy, but the number of people who have read the book and, and, and have since come to me and said, oh my gosh, if I had just, if I knew all these things about Hillary before um, the 2016 election, you know, I'd be curious to hear Basil's thoughts on this also, but my belief was when I um, started in the White House, uh, in the pre-social media days, in the pre, you know, everyone has a brand and everyone, you know, is out posting regularly. You know, she was not somebody who cared very much about, she was, she's a, a policy wonk, cared about the work, did her work. And if people were going to say amazing things to her, great. And if people were going to, you know, say nasty things to her, she could handle it. I mean, you know, Basil and I both had to deal with her when she first showed up in New York. I mean, it was campaigning and on her listening tour and she was first lady, she was mostly welcome, but there were certainly, you know, there were certainly people booing and, um, and, 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 and being, uh, you know, pretty negative. So I start from that place. Like she's not somebody who goes out there looking for, and I, you know, I think, and there are, and there are, uh, 
I don't want to say the word celebrities, but there are people in the public space who seek that, like that, and get something out of it. She goes up there, gives her speech and says, I'm going to solve all of your problems. And then she leaves and then she goes backstage and then she asks you about how your date was or how your kid is or how your mom's feeling. I mean, she really, I think the big surprise or the big reveal in the book is her empathy, her radical empathy. It was how I was raised by my parents. And it's a quality that she has in spades, radical empathy and really caring. I mean, every time I had a problem or I had something to celebrate, she was my friend first and boss second. You know, I write this, you know, the story in the book about how in the middle of impeachment, when she, you know, I'm in this room and I think I'm about to lose my job and she slams a plate down and says, this is not working. I think she's about to fire me. We drive back to the White House and she puts her arm around my shoulder saying, you know, I'm sorry for what I said. You know, even in the midst of like the most insane amount of pressure, she has the ability to find her own humanity, but also um, to connect with others. And I think we went through really decades of just ignoring the nonsense. So when Chelsea had an alien sibling, we're like rolling our eyes saying, okay, okay, whatever. And never took a lot of that stuff very seriously. And that's now changed. We live in a world where ignoring things by the time we got to the 2016 election, when, you know, Jen Palmieri, who we both love and adore, um, it, it not responding very often meant, okay, this must, you know, this must be true. So we were wandering around the country and people were saying, well, you know, she's, she's, she's really, you know, she's secretly really ill. And we would think that's nonsense. No one's going to believe it. People believed it. And the other thing I just, you know, I do share about this in detail is I think it's just a challenge. We as Americans have a hard time seeing women as executives. Um, I mean, there are studies that show it is easier for women to run for Congress or assembly or city council than it is to run for mayor, governor, and forget commander in chief. I mean, we don't have, there is no precedent. So every time she was doing something, she was the first. So what is the first woman president supposed to look like? I don't know. But what I will tell you is everyone has a different opinion. It's she should wear these kinds of suits. She should dress like this, or hair should be like this, or her voice is annoying. And, you know, this, the, the story that just got me the most was you know, a media consultant saying, well, she always looks so angry when she's speaking. So you should put a picture of her granddaughter on the podium and then she'll look at something that makes her happy and then she will be happy. And it turned out to be very difficult, very challenging uh, for us. My summary is the fact that she did so phenomenally well in some ways is kind of a miracle because it is so hard as our sitting vice president is learning in real time now. It is hard for any woman in positions of power. It's we are scared. I mean, it's why I'm raising my son this way, Chris. I mean, it is, I want Jordan not just to respect women, but to not fear their power. And mm -hmm. so it was very cool when we were very, very lucky a, a couple of summers ago to watch a tennis match uh, that uh, Roger Federer was going to be at. And I remember saying to Jordan, Jordan, we're about to go watch the greatest tennis player of all time. And without any irony, he turned to me and said, mommy, are we going to see Serena Williams? Mm -hmm. And the fact that at eight, that was his reality. I was like, you know what? Yes. Good. I mean, good for you. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, you know, this is a good thing. So. Well, for a kid who's shot the links with uh, president Clinton uh, a couple of times, I think maybe kind of learned golf with uh, <laughs> your yeah. boss's, your, your boss's husband. Yes. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So Serena's, <laughs> Serena's no big deal. Uh, is she Basil? <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, you know, Huma, I want to come back to a point that you made earlier about public speaking, because you talk about it in the book, and I and I remember this day so vividly. I want to talk about the press conference. Mm. Um, yeah, this was the press conference where you you know stood up during the campaign and 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 talked about and I guess best way to say it is to, to, to defend it to defend Anthony. I think you write in the book probably, and I think Philippe, who you talk about in the book that we both know, mm. um, mentioned that this might be the first time people hear your voice. Yeah. And this was going to, and did you want this to be the first time that America heard your voice? Um, of course, so many of us heard it and knew it well prior to that. But, and, and, and the thing that we knew is that you are an insanely, and I would say this, intensely private person. And you just, and you talked about that a, a moment ago. 
Talk about that moment when you made a decision to and then gave that press conference. And how did that, if at all, um, give you a voice that you may have needed and or used going forward? So I did decide to do that press conference in 2013 when Anthony decided to run for mayor. And I did it for a very specific reason. And I was very criticized. Not only was I criticized for doing it, um, people uh, you know, called on me to be fired and basically be you know, just removed um, from you know, certainly, certainly Hillary land. And in 2011, when the story first broke about Anthony and he was a sitting member of Congress and you know, in, in my opinion, a, a good member of Congress representing uh, his constituents. Um, I was in such shock. You know, we hadn't even been married a year. I was so in love with him. I was so, we were in this, you know, what I thought this sort of perfect life, perfect marriage, perfect. And so much basil of what connected us was this love of New York, love of public service, love of you know, I couldn't walk down the street with Anthony without somebody saying, I got a problem, Congressman. And he was such a retail politician. He was, you know, pulling his cards out and help. And it was so much about, you know, what he did that I found very attractive. And I thought um, he did very well. And so when the story broke in 2011, I was just in shock. I just couldn't, you know, part of it is like, I didn't see that Anthony. It was, it was, you know, and because so much of his betrayal was in this digital space, and you and I have not had a chance to talk about this. Like, I, I wonder if it was like this, you know, if it was, I did this horrible thing and, you know, um, I'm leaving. It was this, it was this crazy kind of all the digital, like, you know, like a game almost. And I didn't really understand it. I was so, I was also so, um, I was so naive in so many ways. And as you read the book, you'll know, I mean, growing up in the Middle East, I, I, was in, I was in many ways as I write in the book, and we've talked about already, very international, very, I had a very global perspective, but in other ways, very sheltered. And, um, and Anthony was my first serious relationship. So I don't think I was prepared for the level of his mental health challenges, frankly. And what was eventually, you know, revealed as as real, um, you know, challenges with addiction and compulsive behavior. I just figured, you know, this is behavior he could knock off. So in 2013, when he said, "I'm thinking about running for mayor," I encouraged him to do it. And because I felt that, you know, we had been so um, ostracized in 2011. I mean, the that that does something to you when you are in a community and that community says, "You know what." we don't want to have anything to do with you because of this immoral behavior. And people did that to us. And, you know, it's funny, people can give you a million compliments and then one person criticizes you. And then one person who criticizes you just sort of eats you up a little bit. And that definitely happened with us. And, um, and it felt like we were in a bunker together and running for mayor felt like a path back to public service. And I thought he'd be really good at it. It turned out to be a huge mistake. And so when the day the story broke about another woman he'd communicated with during the campaign uh, or right before the campaign, um, I thought, you know, I got to take responsibility. I, I encouraged him to run. Um, and so I did. I paid a heavy price for it. Um, I did. And I still I still don't regret it. I still think it was the right it was the right thing to do. Um, and in the end, it was a mistake for him to have run for mayor. He should have never run. He wasn't healthy. He was not healthy enough mentally, emotionally um, to do it. So here we are, fast forward. It was a, it was a tough, it was a tough period in my life. And, and I also in the dark, I mean, I, this book was meant to come out years ago and I'm glad it came out after Anthony was released from prison and after we were able to go into proper, in, you know, therapy uh, and do a process called a disclosure process so I could understand. I, I felt like I was losing my mind and I went to a very, very low, deep place. I think it's one of the reasons the book, I mean, very humbly, I've, I say this, that it has spoken um, to some, you know, to people who've had to deal with mental health, depression, uh, challenges of betrayal and addiction um, in there, whether it's any loved one, your partner, your spouse, your parent or your child or your friend. And I'll just say very quickly, I, in full disclosure, we met a couple of times on the campaign trail yes. uh, in Harlem. Yes. <laughs> and oh, it's, it, it's, you know, and I can attest, it's an incredible 
uh, retail politics and and um, and yeah, when you when that press conference took place, I remember watching it live and just standing and and saying, "You got this," you know. Yeah. Uh, I, felt, I said, "You got it." I said, "You got this." Yeah. I felt love from my family, no question, and that yet yeah, as you are included in that, I mean, absolutely, I did feel it, and uh, and I continue to feel it. Let's get a quick instruction from Emily, and then I have a, a quick follow-up to the point that you were just making. Emily, we're, uh, there's some uh, some guidance that you want to give the audience around questions for Huma. Yes. If you would like to ask a question, you can do so using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, or you can raise your hand to ask the question live. Great, and there are some questions lined up, Huma. So I'm going to uh, ask one last one very quickly. Uh, on that last, uh, on that moment that you that Basil just asked you about, um, the two of the many things that struck me about uh, what happened with you subsequent to that and some of your analysis of it. One was kind of felt like, I mean, a lot. You all, you almost from other people, not from Hillary Clinton, from other people kind of were put at risk of your job and you lost you that was when it felt like that was uh internal feedback isn't the right word i'm trying to think of a euphemism here because it wasn't constructive towards you internally um maybe one of the first times it, that it seemed that you had gotten that from people inside which had to have been extraordinarily difficult um but it also presented another opportunity for you to explain a mantra of yours that I took away with, which is you make your decision and you live with the consequences. And you said that in a number of, you said that about advancing trips, you choose a cafe and you live with the consequences. And, and that's, that's a, a lesson from the book. Uh, a lot of instances in your life um, that I felt I, I heard you write about. Um, my last question for you uh, is about friendship. I read a Washington Post review of the book, and I read this line, um, an hour earlier, Huma had passed on her most important piece of advice to students, quote, keep your girlfriends close. Um, that's advice I will let my own daughter know that you said. Um, I also remember reading in your book that you realized, you wrote something about where you realized that you can't take friendship for granted. Um, what for you are the keys to friendship? Are they values? Are they experiences? They've friendship has obviously been incredibly uh, important and useful to you. Well, my father always told uh, told us that a good life is a balanced life, and I did not follow that advice. I did not have a balanced life. It was always always about work, and so I do feel as though in my twenties uh, and frankly, even most of my 30s, I, I took many of my friendships for granted. It was when I was available, I would call and say, let's go have lunch, let's go have dinner. Or if I had a problem, I'd reach out and realize that I was not reciprocating in the same way because I was always busy. I was always on an airplane or a train or an event somewhere, or Basil and I were putting out some fire somewhere. But um, it's only when you need those friendships, when you need the advice, you need the company, you don't you know, I believe we are creatures of community. It's where we feel you feel better when you're places that you feel safe and respected and loved. And that can be your family. But I also think there's something very unique, in, in my opinion, in, in, in a female friendships that that having that power together, making sure, you know, feeding each other's, you know, insecurities in a way that says, well, you feel bad about this. Well, I do, too. And how do we do it to, you know, better together? So for me, it has been a great, um, uh, it's, a, it's a great sense of joy for me now. If I'm feeling down or if I feel feeling lonely, I'll just text a couple of girlfriends and say, let's get on the phone or let's go do something. I've discovered that late in life. And I now, I really do cherish it. Uh, that's wonderful. And I'm sure that you do. It's, uh, it, it seems evident. Uh, we have questions. Um, one question is from Barbara Huma, who says, um, thank you so much for sharing your story, your heart, and your passions with the world and with us. I'm in awe of your steadfast bravery 
and ability to navigate the painful parts that most of us would shy, run, and hide away from. I liked this question, this is me talking now, because um, I think a lot of people do feel that way. And I think your book speaks to that. Um, Barbara's question is, uh, Homa, how do you own it? Through every engagement, every opportunity, I have seen you exhibit grace, authenticity, and conscious engagement. How did you do it? And how do you move forward? That is a great, <laughs> that is a great question. I have to give credit to my parents, I think, to be raised by people who, you know, didn't really force us to do very much growing up. They kind of just taught us by example. They sort of showed us the way and to be raised in a world where you had parents who were respected in their communities, who loved their work and, you know, told you you could do whatever you wanted in your life so long as you were educated. That was my only, only condition my parents put upon us. And I think, and encouraged us in whatever. I mean, I wrote terrible poetry when I was a kid and my parents would say, this was brilliant and amazing and, you know, keep writing more. And I think having that grounding, you know, I, my theory, and it's one of the reasons why um, I, I've, I've talked about this a fair amount is that I think so much of it is about the next generation. When you hear stories of people who've had challenges um, in adulthood, when you look to some of the childhood trauma or experiences that they've had, it explains so much, at least to me, uh, some of the decisions and actions they've taken as an adult. So it's all about, it's our responsibility as parents, as we're raising this next generation to ensure that they have, you know, I tell my son every single day that I love him and, and I hold him and I want him to feel like and any fear is okay to share and any feeling is okay to share. Um, and to me, that's contributing to helping to raise a next generation that doesn't, you know, hopefully have some of the traumas that I think some of, you know, certainly I clearly have and, um, and, and many people and many people in public have. Um, and maybe that is the only way that is the only way forward. So I'm constantly future focused. And I always feel, um, you know, I share I wrote this story I got cut from the book because the book was so long. But my father, as both Chris and Basil know, because you've read the book three times between the two of you, um, when he was uh, graduating from university, he was thrown from, he was in the equestrian club and he was thrown from his horse. And it turned out he had broken his back. He was thrown from his horse, walked around for a week in excruciating pain. And then finally the doctor told him he'd broken his back. So when I was 15 uh, and we would take horseback riding lessons in the summers in New Jersey, I um, was I lost control of my horse buttercup that summer and um, I got thrown off of buttercup and I landed on my back and I literally thought I was going to, I was dying. I mean, it was, I was in so much pain and my mother comes running over and my riding instructor comes running over. My mother says, that's it enough. This is too dangerous. She's not doing this again. We're going home immediately. And my father who had broken his own back, what 30 years before looks at me, looks at the horse and he says, no, you are getting back on because if you don't you will be afraid and she will be afraid. And that's the person who rate, I mean, I did. And I, I, it was, you know, and I remember it so clearly, but that's, you know, that's how I was raised. And, and I, I, I guess I credit it to that, those, you know, those roots really. Uh, that's a, a great lesson from your father, but what I'm taking away is, is there anything more cruel than a horse named Buttercup? <laughs> well, I mean, Come on. Buttercup the horse is horse. named Buttercup. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Buttercup. Yeah. yeah. Buttercup. yeah. Nobody ever wanted Buttercup, but that summer I ended up with Buttercup for sure. Buttercup yeah. was not named appropriate. That was that was, no. you know, that was quite a marketing no. job. Did not Buttercup match case. her personality at all. <laughs> um, Christy asks, um, and and Basil, if you're looking at the questions, and are you looking at them? If there's one that you've picked out that you want to um, ask please go ahead. I'm going to do uh, Christie's right here, um, who asks, uh, is there a specific trip or a country you visited during your time working for HRC that has special meaning to you and why? Um, I believe I know the answer, but uh, why don't you tell, tell us the answer and then I'll know whether I was right or not. Well, there's a difference between countries I've loved to visit and I can't wait to go back. And that list is very long. And that's everything from Morocco to Italy, to New Zealand, um, to Botswana. I mean, the list is very long, but uh, India 
And I, I was just in India last week. And in part because, and, I, and as I mentioned, I took my son. Um, I, I very often think about my grandmother, my, my eight-year-old grandmother, I opened the book with her, um, who, you know, living in 1912, Hyderabad, India, where girls were not sent to school, just demanded to go to school. I mean, I don't know what it was about her gut, her intuition, her fearlessness that said, I know that I will change my lot in life and my descendants lot in life. Maybe she knew or she didn't know, but I owe everything to her. And, you know, she, uh, she won that fight, even though it was considered very shameful. Girls did not go to school in 1912 in Hyderabad. And she cut a deal with her parents to like ride on the back of an ox cart, a covered ox cart went to school and went on to raise eight children, all of whom, you know, I'm the least educated person in my family with a bachelor's of arts degree. I'm, you know, nowhere near um, Dr. Smeichel. And, um, and all my, my siblings are doctors. My, both my parents were, you know, professors as well. So I think um, it's, I owe it to that place. And I feel very emotionally connected um, when I go back and I feel a lot of gratitude for the, you know, for what my, my parents did for me. Chris, there's a, there's a question that I saw that I thought I should uh, I should raise here. By the way, Uma, I, I have a PhD, but a lot of my family is medical doctors, and they're like, what are you doing all day? Just reading books? Yeah, <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> Good meal. Totally, Sorry. <laughs> totally. We get that too. They say, oh, you mean you're a paper doctor, right? Like my yeah, sister, right, she's exactly a medical right. doctor. She's like, I'm a doctor doctor. But yeah, my mother's a paper doctor. My mother's a paper doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Barbara, I, this question comes from Barbara and there's a piece of it that I sort of want to pull out and, 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 and then add a little bit onto. So, you know, Barbara says, thank you for being so open and personal on this call. My question is, how do you deal with the frustration? A totally inadequate word regarding what happened in November 2016, the unfairness of that law still hurts me and has altered how I've seen the world since. It shook my faith in humanity and still does. You were right there when it happened. How do you deal with it? The piece that I would want to add on is that we've used terms like trauma and resiliency. I guess that's also, this is this question is also about self-care. Yes. How do you engage oh, that? Amen. I, uh, self-care is such an important word and I didn't understand it and I certainly didn't explore it. And now every time I have an opportunity to, whether it's go to take a walk or just read a book or just sit in silence and meditate or just pray, I mean, you know, just remove myself from the world, I think is so important to answer the question. It was a process, you know, walking around those of you who are in New York, certainly in New York City, it, those days and weeks after the election, it was I, it was like a, it felt like a unanimous morning and it did feel unfair and it did feel like a sucker punch and it did feel like failure. And many of us took responsibility. And I write in detail about my own personal responsibility that I felt um, uh, that I had to take. And it was very, very hard uh, uh, to, I, I did have to eventually get um, professional help, but in part, having you know Hillary as a role model. I mean, gosh, talk about somebody who is the the epitome of resiliency and figuring out how to get back uh, up and move on. I mean, she just, I, I she just not does not have a pessimistic bone in her body, and I think being surrounded in that kind of culture um, helped make it through. And frankly, not to you know bring a sore, sore subject up, but so much of what she talked about in 2016, so much about what she warned about. We have either lived through or we are living through, uh, including right. this war, right? Exactly. Right at this moment. Uh, so much of what she said in 2014, 2015, and 2016 now feels prescient. Um, and that's just uh, speaks to how extraordinary she is as a, as, a, as a diplomat, as a public policy developer, thinker, the way she thinks about how to create um, and how to solve problems is I've, I've seen nothing like it. I mean, I think when President Obama at that convention in Philadelphia in July of 2016 said she is not the most qualified woman to run for president, she is the most qualified human, full stop, period. Um, he was right. We have just a couple of moments left before we all uh, have to go practice some self-care and <laughs> eat dinner and feed kids and any other obligations or privileges. Um, Mary Noel, we, I want to take a question uh, from live from the audience. Mary Noel, if you could unmute yourself, maybe you are, nope, you look like you're muted. If you could unmute yourself, uh, we could take your question, please. And you're still muted. Can I unmute you? 
I can't. Mary Noel, you got to do it yourself. I can't do it. We can go. Emily, are, are you able to help Mary Noel? Sure. We can go to David. Okay. Sorry, Mary Noel. David, are you able to unmute yourself? See, I can't mute myself and they can't unmute themselves. It's the uh, opposite problem. Emily, do you want to go with them or should we go with one more from the uh, pre-existing? Yes, go with the Q&A. Okay. Uh, there was, oh, here we go. Um, I know which one. Where is it? Here we go. Um, Huma, have you considered running for office yourself? Bruce wants to know. I think you would bring a lot that we need these days. Bruce. So here's your chance. This is <laughs> Bruce. Make news. Come on, Huma. You're asking the wrong Clinton alum on this Zoom. That is a question for Dr. Basil Smichael, not yeah, for me. Been there, done that. Um, I know you good. have. I'm good. I know you have. <laughs> I'm good. Never say never. Um, I do not plan on running for office. I, this is my year of saying yes. I have stolen that line from Shonda Rhimes, but I, I, I mean, I do want to say never say never, but I, I don't really see, um, I don't see that in my future. Um, what about your boss in 2024? I, I, not to disappoint, disappoint you, Chris, if you're expecting for some breaking news, but she's, I am. Yeah. I am. <laughs> yeah, no, she's not running for president. We have a I know, I know, that. <laughs> I know that. No, 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 no. Right um, now. We're all good. Oh, thank you. Thank you for uh, taking the time with us, Basil. Uh, I, I think goodbyes from you to your uh, longtime friend, I would not say old friend, um, are the proper way to close. Uh, but for me, Homa, thank you uh, so much for this conversation. Um, Basil, I'll turn it over to you to uh, good night us all. I just want to bring a quick memory. Uh, we were at a Baptist church in the Bronx, uh, a Trinity Baptist Church, and Hillary comes in and the whole congregation is on their feet. She's making a speech where if you, if folks that in the audience remember in response to some comments by then Senator Trent Lott uh, in support of Strom Thurmond's potential candidacy for president. And her speech was so powerful, so, um, I mean, just so strong. And I was sitting right next to you and we looked at each other and we're like, that's I think the best that we've ever heard her. And I just remember that moment among so many that we were privileged to be a part of not just history, but a history maker who was incredibly generous and supportive. And I want to add you to that, to that characterization, very um, giving and supportive, both of your time, of your expertise and your support. Um, and, and we thank you, I thank you for all that you have been and will be in this world. Well, I appreciate, I've, I've so enjoyed this conversation. I have loved being in community with both of you and everyone watching and hope everyone continues to stay safe as we were reminded today that, you know, the pandemic is still out there in the world and we all need to remain vigilant. And there is a lot of uncertainty um, uh, happening at the moment. So these are scary times and, um, and just wishing everyone stay safe, stay, stay safe and healthy and, and really continue to, um, you know, support, uh, our, our, uh, I don't even know what the right word is, but the heroes and heroines in Ukraine who are, you know, standing up for what democracy means. It's a real lesson for all of us, a reminder for how precious democracy is. For sure. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you uh, all. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Have a great night. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you.